where are the best opportunities in the resource sector right now? And what is it like to make changes from within the company itself? We're speaking today with an investor who's very hands-on in his investing approach, and he'll explain exactly what that means. Michael Gentile is a new guest with us. He is a strategic resource investor, and he has been a fund manager for more than a decade prior to investing on his own behalf in the resource sector. He's going to be giving us a bunch of tips, advice, and his macro overview of mining and metals. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. Great to be with you. Michael, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? It's your first time on the show. Give us a bit of your background and what it is you do now. Yeah, I spent uh, 17 years as an institutional uh, money manager, uh, over 20 years uh, professionally investing in the commodity sector in particular, uh, oil, copper, gold, silver, pretty much any, any commodity that I found interesting at the time. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had twin girls decide to take a, a step away from the professional money management business and start investing my own personal capital uh, quite heavily in the exploration, uh, junior exploration sector. I was quite bullish on gold at the end of 2018 when it was out of favor, but the gold price started to lift. And I found amazing value and opportunities in the junior exploration space. And I kind of carved out a niche for myself the last two, three years, being a very impactful, hands-on, you know, 10 to 20% investor in junior exploration companies where I feel there's huge potential. Uh, but where they could use some help on the capital markets and strategy size, the strategy side of things to take their companies to the next level. Right. And why did you focus on the resource sector? What drew you to that sector in particular? You could you could take your capital and invest in any sector you wish. Why the resource sector? Yeah. Great question, David. I mean, I tend to be very contrarian. So I've made a lot of money in commodities over the years, investing in the commodities when they're deeply out of favor. So my first commodity was in the late 90s, as you recall, oil was mm -hmm. going from you know $10 a barrel. People said it's going to go to five. The end of oil was over. And oil went from five to 140. So if you can find a sector where you're positive on the commodity outlook and you couple in exploration success with new discoveries, I mean, that's how you can make 30 to 50, 100 times your money in some stocks. So I really fell in love with the commodity sector for that purpose, where you have a rising commodity potential with new exploration discovery. It's a beautiful cocktail for investors if you get it right. So that's really what attracted to me. Okay. And over the years, I've kind of cycled from commodity to commodity based on my, on my macro views and try to find, time the cycle and then find some great investments within, within that commodity sector right. as well. All right. Well, perfect segue into your macro views now, Michael. You said you're contrarian by nature. Well, what is the mainstream view regarding gold right now? And do you feel the same way? Yeah. So right now, I'd say sentiment's pretty negative on gold. Uh, I was pretty euphoric in August, but I think all that's been washed out of the market. If you look at some of the leading sentiment indicators in gold, they're, they're at two to three year lows right now. And you know, if you ask me why, David, the commodity is down, the simple reason I think to explain it is, is rates are up. You look at the 10 year yield, it's gone from about 0.4% to 1.4, I think this morning, or 1.45 last I checked. And typically when rates rise, it's usually a negative for gold. So I wouldn't say it's a bad knee jerk reaction, but I think in this case, investors are getting it completely wrong. And the reason is that, quite simply, the U.S. government or any G7 government cannot afford rates to go up. If you look at the amount of debt they've strapped on over the last 15 years, in particular in the last two years from the pandemic, uh, the U.S. government's a great case study. I'll give you some real round, easy to understand numbers. Post this latest stimulus package from Biden, the U.S. government will have around $30 trillion of debt by the time this is all said and done. If you look at pre-pandemic in 2019, the U.S. government was taking in $3 trillion of revenue in one of the best economies in the last 20 years and spending $4 trillion. So they're running a $1 trillion deficit in a really strong economic environment. The interest on their debt of that $4 trillion of spending a year was $400 billion, so about 10% of their, their total spending. If you take the $30 trillion debt they have now, assume rates go to 5%, which is not a crazy number historically on a 100-year perspective, that would be $1.5 trillion, David, of interest expense, which would be 50% of their revenues, up from 10% of their revenues. So quite simply, they'd be completely insolvent at that level of, of interest rates. And that same math works for Canada, it works for Europe, it works for the Asian economies. So you know the rates are going up because people think inflation is going higher, and I think inflation is going higher. But the math they're forgetting is the government cannot afford higher interest rates. So what you're going to see very soon is the Federal Reserve is going to have to come in and suppress rates, suppress the 10-year, potentially suppress the 30-year rates so the government can pay their bills. In that scenario, when you have inflation running hot, and rates being artificially suppressed, that means negative real rates, which is the most bullish backdrop for gold possible. Yeah. And that's been completely ignored in the market right now. You brought, up a key, well, you brought up several key points I'd like to touch on. First of all, you said that uh, uh, should interest rates rise above a certain threshold, the government could be insolvent. I, wouldn't that overwrite every single finance textbook out there that treasuries by definition are risk-free, triple A? It's impossible for the government of the United States to be insolvent. How would that work? Well, 
they would be insolvent, but they'll be paying you back in, in artificially deflated dollars, right? So which is right. the backdrop where you have inflation at six, seven percent, let's say, and rates that are three or four percent, they'll be returning your money in money it's worth ever less every single year in real purchasing power. Yeah. So that that's what I mean by that. That they're gonna have to do that. Otherwise, if they take the hard line and don't don't inflate and don't, you know, suppress rates, they're not gonna be able to pay back their debt. So yeah, to your point, David, about risk-free rates, I mean. I, I would not buy any sovereign debt <laughs> yielding zero to one percent anywhere in anywhere in the world. You're getting return with no you're getting no return with all the risk, right? So yeah, I, I am wanting to stay away from that, which has also been positioning why positioning in gold myself for the last four or five years. Okay, so uh, you mentioned there are several leading indicators for gold that are all pointing towards uh, bearish sentiment. Can you describe what these leading indicators are? While well, you talked about yields, is there anything else? Yeah, yields, U.S. dollar. Uh, outlook okay. for, I mean, you're, you're also seeing that you see it probably with your, your, your investments and your viewers, uh, a lot of speculation in the market right now, whether it be cryptocurrencies and tech stocks and some of the Robinhood stuff you're seeing. So when you have a wild speculative frenzy in the market, which I think we're actually in right now, that also takes money out of gold, right? Because gold is a safe haven asset. Why would mm -hmm. you want to buy gold when you can make 200% a day trading GameStop, right? So there's, there's a speculative fever that's taking money out of gold. The fact that rates are rising, taking money out of gold, the expectation of an economic recovery is taking money out of gold. But like I said earlier, the government just cannot afford the, the interest on their debt. And the Federal yeah. Reserve is going to have to cap those rates. If rates go higher, by the way, David, you're going to see a lot of these speculative stocks get crunched and get destroyed because they're they're trading off the zero percent discount rate. So if your rate goes from zero percent to four or five percent and you run that through your discounted cash flow models or your valuation models, those stocks trading at 40 times sales or 50 times sales will no longer be able to sustain those valuations. So sure. the Fed is the Fed is trapped from a market perspective and, and the government's trapped from a too much debt perspective. So I think sure. we're going to see intervention after intervention by the government to suppress rates to avoid these bad things from happening. Well, the devaluation of the dollar is uh, one of the principal reasons that I understand as to why you're investing in gold, but why gold in particular? Any asset that by definition beats the dollar could be a good dollar hedge, right? Yeah, I think gold has the added attribute that they're, it's not economically sensitive. So, uh, okay. you know, like there's some bullish cases for copper or other commodities, but they tend to rely on the strength of the economy. So in a, in a negative economy, you know, you'll see demand for copper or oil, other commodities fall, whereas gold will be viewed as a safe haven hedge. So it has that attribute that it'll perform well in a downturn, in addition, protect you from inflation, where the other commodities tend to have that, mm -hmm. that dual nature where they need to have an economic tailwind at their back and also have, uh, you know, devaluing dollar to help support yeah. the price. So you're right, gold does have a very high correlation to inflation and in particular inflation expectations. So what are your expectations for inflation? The, uh, we're speaking this week on the heels of Jerome Powell's testimony with Congress. And he has, he has said that while he does expect inflation to pick up, he does not expect it to be a persistent long-term force. Do you agree with that statement? I, I disagree strongly with that statement. Okay. You'll, you'll, never, you'll never hear a central banker say, our textbook plan is to create as much inflation as possible that we can get away with. I mean, that that is the reality. If you run the numbers, David, on the debt, there's just no way out for the government. Their, their textbook that they'll never tell you is, let's run inflation significantly hotter than our nominal rates so we can pay back our fixed debt holders with currency that's worth ever less in the future. But any central bank that comes out and says that publicly is putting a bullet in their currency or putting a bullet in their ability to borrow the market. So he also said that uh, money supply no longer has a relationship with economic growth and inflation. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of mumbo jumbo coming out of Central Bank. Again, like I'm not here just to, to criticize. They're very smart people, but they have an sure. agenda behind the scenes versus an agenda where they actually tell the public. And, sure. and the, numbers is, the numbers are incontournable. You can't get around the number of debt that we have in the world today. And you need a way out. And inflation is the easiest and most uh, simple way for the government to solve their problems. Um, I, 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 I was looking at gold from um, a perspective of how much real goods it could buy. And I constructed a yep. gold to Big Mac index basically it shows uh yeah basically it shows how many big macs you can buy with gold and what i what i what i what i found was that uh gold's purchasing power has peaked in the last two decades at 2011 so even though mm -hmm. gold's re price in nominal terms has increased uh last year and breached new all-time highs its purchasing power has not so uh, what's your view on this do you expect gold to continue to outperform inflation over the next two to five years and ultimately where do you see the gold price headed yeah, I think on your on your Big Mac ratio, it kind of showed me on your chart at least that there was room to run. And I think what's happening is that it's not at the all-time high because of some of those speculative corners of the market that are pulling money out of the gold market, the rising rates. I think it's a short-term confluence of factors, but I expect that that ratio to not only be caught up and maybe hit a new high in terms of gold to Big Mac ratio, but probably beyond that as investors really realize that the, the long-term game is inflation and money printing and devaluation of the currency. So I think there, I think as a preservation of, of wealth, uh, gold is the number one asset that you can turn to. 
And I think it's undervalued right here, right now, which makes my call quite topical uh, in terms of potential a catch-up trade to get back to those levels and then a long-term sustained preservation of capital for, for the longer term. Is there an exit level for you? Once gold hits a certain price level, you would think uh, it's time to take some profits or are you holding it just as a wealth preservation well into the future? Yeah, I mean, right now I'm heavily invested in gold. I'd say maybe 80% of my net worth is invested in gold. That is a, not a normal allocation, as you might know from a, from a typical investment advisor perspective. Uh, I would say my typical exit being a contrarian in the commodity space, when everybody loves gold, when the, the cab the Uber drivers, the teachers, the, the people on Twitter and, and Reddit are talking about gold, they all own gold stocks. That's typically my cue to exit and find something else that's more hated or more disliked by the market. Mm -hmm. I think we're a long, long way from that, David, right now. I think the crypto okay. space is where you see that kind of activity. Right. Uh, but I don't think gold is mainstream. Your, your viewers are very obviously interested in gold, but in general, the mainstream is not adopted gold. If anything, they're they're avoiding it these days. I, yeah, that, that's a good point. But I, I, I have to I have to uh, give a rebuttal here. I, I, I don't remember the last time the general public has been interested in gold, Michael. Maybe this is just something that you, people yeah, don't pay attention to. 2008 to 2011 probably was, okay. was a pretty pretty robust time. And I think it was a very similar backdrop where you had a huge amount of money printing from the Federal Reserve and you had the consequences of that spilling out for multiple years. What we've seen the last three years makes the 2008 crisis look like a drop in the bucket. I mean, the right. amount of money printing and intervention you see in the economy makes 2008 look like an air pocket. Mm -hmm. And I remember living through 2008 going, this is unheard of, ridiculous intervention by the government. And it's actually looking quite small in comparison. So I think 2008, 2011 is a good a good time frame when there was widespread journalist investor interests and retail interests in the stocks. It was very topical. We were making lots of money in the sector. I think those days are going to come back. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about stocks because I know yep. you are uh, heavily invested in stocks as well. By the way, when you say 80% allocation to gold, you're talking about gold bullion and gold stocks. Is that correct? Yeah, I mainly invest in the equities data because if you're bullish right. on gold, you get the maximum leverage by buying equities. So I'm not sitting with a bunch of gold stored in a vault. Okay. Uh, I typically like the equities for the exposure and torque and then the ability to make discoveries, right? Find, finding new ounces of gold at very low discovery costs okay. is, is an also way to create a lot of wealth. So yeah, I'm, I'm basically all invested in okay. equities, gold-related equities right now. I'll, I'll let you take the lead in this part of the interview and uh, talk about some of the stocks you do like. Maybe you can walk through your thesis on some of these stocks and uh, your stock selection process. And also importantly, why why you think these junior miners are um, a good proxy for gold? Because like you said, they, they have good leverage on the upside, but there is significant downside as well. Gold in itself yep. is a safe haven asset, but if you're talking about junior miners that have significant downside risk, are you not taking away the safe haven aspect of the investing? Good, good question. So, so Dave, I guess I, when, I, when I started investing heavily uh, in the junior exploration space, I tried to take my institutional money management framework to the exploration space. And when I invested heavily in producing gold companies in the past as an institutional investor, so what I tried to do when I looked at the exploration space, is you know, David, 95% or more of the exploration companies that you will invest in and look at will never become a mine. So if you wanna make 20, 30, 50, 100 times your money in the junior exploration space, what you really need to look for is companies that you have a high level of conviction that will actually become a mine. If you become a produce, producing asset in the future, and you can identify them when they're under 150 or less market million market caps. That's how you can make 10, 50, 100 times your money. Because those are the assets that are really going to have a long-term, enduring, sustaining value. So I try to look at that for that matrix. Whether you're an early stage exploration company or someone's made a discovery already or moving towards production, does this asset actually have what it takes to become a producing asset? So my criteria, there, there's six that I look for, David. I'll give you mm -hmm. really quickly. Uh, grade, really important. So grade is the margin. You know, how much, how much of the commodity you have per, per ton of material. Sure. Uh, potential mm -hmm. for scale. Really important, is there enough material in that deposit to have a major producer want to come in and produce that mine in the future? Uh, infrastructure, are you close to power, roads, water? Are you, even more important, are you close to existing producing mills where you can use the infrastructure that's already there and save your lot, a lot of capital for your shareholders? Uh, permitting, you might have all those great attributes, but you might be in a place where there's actually zero social license to build a mine. You might be stuck for 15 years trying to get a permit. So that could be a real deal breaker. So how easy it is to build a mine in the jurisdiction where you've made that discovery. And the last two are, are a solid geological team. So do you have someone on the team that's actually made a commercial discovery in their career and knows the difference between economic ore and just finding ore that maybe will never get produced? And then finally, where I stepped in very heavily myself is, does the team or the board or the management have any understanding of capital markets, of how to properly fundraise an exploration company, how to raise capital on the right terms and from the right shareholders at the right times? Because you can have a great team of geos that will destroy a tremendous amount of value because they dilute themselves very heavily by making bad decisions around financing. So if you have those six attributes in a project, no guarantee, but you're highly likely to increase your success rate of finding assets that are, 
are going to yeah. be producers in the future and return lots of money for your shareholders. Perfect. Let's walk through some uh, examples now. Yeah, so some of the investments I've made in the last couple of years, some big ones. Uh, first of all, I talk about Roscan Gold, ticker is ROS. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a director of the company. I'm the largest single shareholder of the company. Uh, I bought a large uh, significant stake in late 2019, early 2020, because this asset you know, ticked all the boxes. They were hitting some of the highest grades in all of West Africa and Mali, you know, five grams over 50 meters, you know, four grams over 60 meters, some very, very high grade intercepts, which are truly world-class. Um, they're in a district of West, Western Africa and Mali where B2 Gold's Fakola mine and Barrick's Lulu mine is right next door. There's, these are two, David, 550 to 600,000 ounce producing gold mines each. These are some of the largest gold mines in the world. And the Roscan Gold's land package is basically within a stone throw of those two producing assets. So you're in the right zip code for infrastructure and size and basically elephant country when it comes to deposits. Mm -hmm. um, permitting, you know, it's very easy to work in West Africa. There is some political risk there, but it's probably the jurisdiction I've looked at where you can go fastest from a discovery hole to first production anywhere in the world. They're very friendly, very proactive. They want the development, they want the revenue. So you can move a project forward very, very quickly in West Africa, which is very important from an economic standpoint. And our geological team and our management team, we have, you know, Sir Sam Jonah as chairman of the board. He's a legend in West Africa. I've been involved in multi-billion dollar West African mining ventures, uh, been knighted by the by the Queen of England. Uh, to have someone like him as the chairman of a junior mining company is truly exceptional. Wow. We just attracted Vincat uh, to our board last week or two, two weeks ago. He's the former CEO of Anglo Gold Ashanti up until 2018. Again, to attract someone like that to your board as a junior is unheard of. And Nana Samura, our CEO, has got 15 plus years of financing West African mining companies, is, is from West Africa. So to have a team, this is an A++ team, David, uh, probably a team that should be mining a $5 billion mining company running a $100 million Canadian junior. So the combination of an A team with an A asset with an A jurisdiction in terms of gold potential uh, is a real winning combination for for potentially for shareholders. Well, as an investor, when you buy these companies, are you looking? Uh, are you hoping that they would be bought out by a senior, or are you hoping that they would be going into production themselves? What is your preference? Yeah, so I mean that's where my checklist comes in. I, I try to think like a senior producer would, and sort of yeah. say, okay, what are the attributes that they look for? Uh, obviously, the, the potential to take out is a nice exit strategy for many of the juniors I'm involved in. In the case of Ross Can Gold, uh, we have a team there that's put you know 18 mines or more into production in their history, right? So this is a team that can do it on their own. And what that does, Dave, is if you can do it on your own, that means the price that another player has to come in and pay you to buy your asset from you instantly goes higher because you have the ability to bring that asset all the way to production. Some juniors are very upfront saying, look, we're never going to put this in production. Uh, we want to sell. That's great. And if you have a good enough asset, you will. But the maximum tension you can create for your shareholders is to have a team that can take it all the way and then have a big producer force it out of your hands by paying you a price that you I can't see. refuse. And as a director, what are some of the changes you you strive to make that can improve shareholder value? Like you, you step into the board, what's your next step? Yeah, so I spent 17 years as an institutional investor. And quite honestly, probably I didn't spend enough time uh, on, on boards. Boards are really, really important. And I would say that the, mo the smaller the company, the more important the board becomes. And, and why do I say that, David? It's because, you know, look at most juniors that I've invested in and probably you're invested in. Look at their full-time payroll. They may have two to five full-time employees if they're lucky, right? So when you look at a board of five to seven people, the board number board members of a junior mining exploration company actually outnumber the full-time employees. So when I joined the boards of any of these companies, there was a lot of changes that I that I helped happen and, and instigate at these, at these board levels, not because the board members were bad, but I felt that in a junior mining company, if you only have two to five employees and you have five board members, six board members, those board members have to be willing to roll up their sleeves and almost work like employees to drive the company forward. It's not enough to attend four to six meetings and give some insight every couple of months, but you want the board members that are, are big shareholders, that are highly engaged, that are willing to do investor calls, uh, geologic work, uh, engineering studies, anything they can do to drive the company forward, because by them adding the weight to the company, you're more than doubling the horsepower of the company. And that's very important at junior exploration level. So I look for heavily engaged boards, people that are really willing to get heavily involved and that are willing to own a lot of stock. So they're going to be up all night thinking about how they can maximize the outcome for the shareholders. Uh, well, can you walk us through your valuation process? How do you how do you identify the net asset value of a mine that has a project that hasn't been mined yet, or perhaps even not even fully discovered yet? Yeah. So uh, if I'm convinced they're economic ounces, David, then mm -hmm. you can you can do some preliminary you know desktop uh, economic studies. Not all investors can do that. So for the investors that can't build a DCF model or an engineering based uh, exploration or production model, I mean you can look at a per ounce value uh, in the ground. But again, don't, a lot of your investors, viewers might get caught because all ounces are not completed equal, right? If sure. you're convinced that these ounces are going to be brought into production, let's say you value the ounces in the ground at Ross Can Gold at $100 an ounce, right? Sure. If you know the mine next door is doing 600,000 ounces a year, and you know the cash cost approximately on Ross Can Gold's production eventually in a production area could be $600 an ounce, 
that's $1,200 margin at current gold prices, right? So the mine next door can hypothetically pay two, three, four dollars an ounce for Roscan Gold's okay. ounces. They still have wildly creative margins. So I look at ounces in the ground versus what it would cost to build the mill and the costs, what margin is left, and then discount that back to today and see does that make sense on a per share basis. So you use a lot of comparables relative to its peers. Yeah, um, comparables okay. are economic value. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I guess the uh, we have time for one more example. Can you talk about another stock that you like and uh, how well it's performed? Yeah, I would say a second example would be uh, Nordic Superior Resources. Uh, it's another company I, I made a very large investment, became, again, the largest shareholder. At full disclosure, I'm a director of the company uh, since late 2019, early 2020. Uh, this one's a little bit earlier stage uh, than Roscan, but really intriguing to me, David, because they have three distinct assets, uh, two in Quebec and one in Ontario, all within one junior exploration company. And what's really unique about it is I think each of those three assets could be their own standalone junior company with a very significant market cap and following. Uh, all three assets have uh, commercial, you know, great intercepts on the property. So there's already a proven, you know, gold system on all three properties. Uh, since I joined the company, the company was severely undercapitalized, had zero uh, Wall Street or Bay Street exposure, uh, but had no money to drill. They now have $10 million cash in the bank, uh, fully funded to drill all three of their projects. Uh, we've made a major discovery right next to uh, Nelligan's 3.2 million ounce uh, Nelligan property, I am Gold's property in, in Quebec. We have the TPK project in Northern Ontario, which is quite simply one of the largest, most exciting exploration projects I've seen in my career. All three of these projects are going to get drilled in the next six months, and each one of them could be worth more than the market cap with any exploration success. So it's a it's a little earlier stage, but a lot of high impact drilling going on there. A great team we brought on the board, both from a geology and a capital mm -hmm. markets perspective, with a high alignment of shareholder interest. The board and management owned over 20% of the company. So a really good recipe for success and a high impact program to come in the next six months. I'm just looking at Roscan's uh, stock, for example, just going back to Roscan as an example, it hasn't really moved much in the last two years. What, as a junior miner, what, what does a junior miner need for the stock to see an impetus to the upside? What typically needs yeah, to you, happen? If you look at Roscan, I joined the board, it was around 10 cents a share. Uh, they made a, a major discovery in Southern Mancuki that kind of shot the stock up from 10 cents to the 40 to 50 cent range. Uh, why I'm so excited about the opportunity of Roscan is, David, since that first discovery, they've made four more discoveries. So they've made five gold discoveries in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. And due to the bit of the bearishness in the market, the market quite understanding what that means. But, you know, our CEO, Nana Samura, said that, you know, basically everywhere we've drilled in this gold belt, we've made a gold discovery. So that there's a highly prospective land that could potentially have for multi-million ounces. What we need to see really is some more follow-up holes to show that these things have multi-million ounce potential. Uh, but clearly, the, the stock's been about a basing pattern for about a year on 40 cents. Yeah. But I think the, the potentials will become very, very clear in the coming months that this is going to be a, hopefully a multi-million ounce gold camp. Uh, yeah. Like I said, in the shadows of very strong producing assets. I, I misspoke. I meant the last one year, but you're, you're absolutely right. And over the last uh, two to three years, it's shot up from 13, 10 cents to uh, currently about uh, 40, 40, cents, 40 cents a share. Uh, well, congratulations on your investments, Michael. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you on Kiko News, and I hope you uh, come back again to give us more updates. A lot of fun, David. My pleasure. Thanks so much. And thank you for watching Kiko News. Don't forget to subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more.